Welcome to Way Out Radio. Today, we're about to do an interview with CC and Rude Girl, aka Chris Constantino and Jenna Dickens. Chris was the bassist and backing vocalist for Adam Ant from 1982 to 86 and performed on Top of the Pops and even Live Aid. He's also worked with Sinead O'Connor, Rat Scabies of the Damned, Wilco Johnson and many more. Jenna is an up-and-coming rapper and singer who has sung guest vocals for Basement Jacks. Time for an interview with them now, so let's find out what brought them together and what kind of music they're making. Hello, Jenna and Chris. How are you doing? Hey. Yeah, I'm good. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. So where are you guys at the moment? Unrevealed place. <laughs> in a bunker. <laughs> Hiding. Both in the UK, right? In the UK. Yeah, yeah. I think that's good enough, isn't it? I guess yeah, the yeah. stalkers can find you that way. But yeah, um, yeah, the UK is, is, is good enough for me. But uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> Have you ever yeah. had stalker problems? It can be quite scary. Um, so I've had, well, I had one for seven years. And then it went on a bit longer and then that was to do, I mean, and then I started getting some new stuff and I, I kind of got a bit paranoid with it, you know, sort of giving out your location because this stalker was turning up to my door and all that stuff. So, um, yeah, it's kind of gets a bit, bit much and the police don't take it seriously. So eventually yeah. you start getting all this weird shit through your letterbox, like, you know, stuff, uh, you know, dipped in blood and nooses, wow. shit like that. And um, yeah, it was like really, really, really so mental. Or something. Yeah, it was like really sort of odd, odd stuff, and um, and all these sort of um, voodoo curses and stuff like that. Um, and then I started getting all these messages on my answer, and I used actually one of them as a sample for a beginning of a track. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, nice. Oh, yeah. I, I didn't have any. Have you, have you had any, Jenna? Um, I did once when I was really young. I had yeah. like, cause yeah, I was like, I was doing like gigs and stuff, and then I had this woman like come to my mum's door, and I was literally like thirteen. My mum was like, "We need to stop putting our address in the in the newspapers and stuff, cause what the hell?" <laughs> it was really <laughs> creepy. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Well, I used to play drums in a band called Ray Gun, and we like. Mm. We turned up to a show. When I had this like really friendly like man who was like sort of coming to a lot of shows and stuff and just always chatting to me. And I was quite naive and I was like, he's nice. <laughs> and, then, and then one day he just turned up at a show and was like, I'm with the band. It was like demanding entry and was like demanding like drinks and like food and stuff from these organizers. And it was like a charity event and we didn't know really who he was. And he was going, and then he got a megaphone out and was just like, Ray Gun, they're on at 4 p.m. And, and we were just like, <laughs> he's not with us. <laughs> oh, that is just... that Do you still play thing. drums, Paula? Yeah, yeah. I've got my drum kit set up at the moment, but I'm mostly- really. DJ as well, so yeah, I'm learning to scratch vinyl and uh, all that sort of business. So that's fun. Wow, brilliant! Yeah. You have to come and you have to come and do some drums for us. Yeah, I'd love to, man. Yeah, man. Yeah, that'd, that'd be so cool. cool. I'll send you some of my stuff. Um, yeah. All right, back to the matter at hand. <laughs> <laughs> so Jenna, your your yeah. alias is Rude Girl, and uh, you previously did some backing vocals with Basement Jacks. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, that was cool. Um, I was in like a band when I was like 16. And basically, yeah, they invited us down to um, do like a track with them, with Basement Jacks. And I was just like fangirling because I was so young. So I was just like, wow, (laughs) the whole time. (laughs) It was fun. Wicked. So um, where can people find that? Is that... Um, it's on their album Scars. Um, it's called Twerk Twerk, which is really funny because like Bunny in our band now, she's like the twerk extraordinaire. So it was like, it was all meant to happen. <laughs> like, twerking <laughs> from then. <laughs> yeah, nice. <laughs> so you were born in London and then you were raised in South Wales. So what part of London are you from originally? Um, I was born in East Putney and then we moved up um to Wales yeah when I was like two so I don't really have like any memories of growing up in London it's like all 
Wales or like a proper little Welsh girl. Um, but yeah, mm. I ran away back to London when I was 16. So, yeah. Wow, cool. So um, you had a bit of a tough time growing up in Wales, did you? And you were like, um, you yeah. suffered some, some hard times there. Yeah, it was a bit mad. I think because in the 90s as well, it was like, you know what I mean? Like there was a lot of like racism, like skinheads and stuff like that. Chris knows as well. Like, I don't know, when you come from like a little town, anyone that's different, it doesn't even need to be like race. It's just anything, you know what I mean? Like gay or you dress different or you like different music or whatever. And you're just going to get it because mm. it's just like towns. You have like those small minded town people. And so, yeah, yeah, just had it from all angles, really. I was gay, mixed race, love rock. <laughs> like, I was just, I was just Freedom. doomed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, that's crazy. It's funny, though, with those sort of, like, racist comments, I mean, I kind of mm. got, in the end, you sort of get so much of it when you're growing up. Mm. You have to, I mean, okay, you know, like I remember sort of knocking some guy out and I lost my temper and I just thought, and then I got a rep reputation that mm -hmm. not to mess with me, but you know, there's still, when there's gangs of skinheads, you're still going to get yeah, messed man. up, you know, attacked. So, um, you know, I don't know really, but um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't s happen so much, I guess. No, anymore. it makes some good music though, doesn't it? Yeah. All that anger. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah definitely you gotta channel it <laughs> yeah like, man so chris you were born at charing cross hospital down in london and then at yes three, you moved to plymouth so um <laughs> you're a london boy as well i'm i'm from london like i said but um, yeah so you went to plymouth college and Pr plymouth art college um i mean that covers quite a lot of your youth but give us a quick um background about like growing up how you felt about school um School was kind of, I got chucked out of every school, first schools, and then... Um, I'll get an A in rock and roll, mate. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> and then sort of, you know, so it just fights and all that sort of shit. And then um, I just got into music and it all started to sort of make sense, really. Yeah. You know, sort of uh, sports, then music. Um, and um, that just, as soon as I sort of, found the bass guitar or music started playing it sort of all just became clear that that was my way out of this shit um and then i just got in a van and went to london slept in the van got a record deal and sort of you know just the usual sort of thing really sort of yeah yeah so how did music come into your life and this is a question for both of you like and when did you start playing live um uh, do you want to go first chris He's um, beer, I think. <laughs> oh yeah, sorry, just having some idea. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, um, <laughs> you caught me. You, you caught me. It was, no, it's just water. It's just water. Um, yeah. So, um, where did I start? I started uh, first gig was in, uh, I think it was in the youth club um, in Plymouth. Nice. And then started Those there. Club days. <laughs> yeah, you know, it was like sort of, you know, standard sort of youth club. And it was like, I think I'd, it was like um, maybe 20 people, you know. Uh, we had a church sort of youth thing. club. So yeah. I remember like we had a gig there. And I was only about 13. And we were like lugging these heavy drums through the door. And on the <laughs> other side of the glass, they were all like praying before like we all came in. And we were just like banging on the glass like, do you mind? These are really heavy. And they were like, oh, you've inter interrupted our prayer. I was like, it's really fun. Roll, mate. Come on. That's, That's hilarious. hilarious. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. Uh, even 13 year old I was <laughs> bloody hell that's, that's good though you start and that's playing drums yeah 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 I've played since I was eight years old bloody wow <laughs> wow I'm not just seeing you play then yeah no I'll send you some stuff man um yeah yeah I've played all my life I could do like jazz everything but mostly really played in rock wow. bands <laughs> yeah um, Moving on, <laughs> right, Jenna. <laughs> so, how did music come into your life? When did you start playing gigs? Um, I started writing songs um, when I was eight. Like, I was like listening to like other songs and stuff, and I was like, oh, like let me try and do this. So, I was writing since I was eight, and then I started playing gigs when I was like eleven. Um, 
and yeah the first gig I did it was in this like underage 18 like under 18 club and it was like you know like back in the 90s when it's like all like drum and bass and like trance and jungle and all that yeah yes. it, it, <laughs> it was one no, of I'm those joking. ones like all the ravens like <laughs> raving <laughs> it was like this like mc battle and like there was no girls up there it was always like these 17 year old boys like yo mc to the one to the two you know all that <laughs> and i went up there and was like yo <laughs> i was like 11 and yeah i won and then so i was like oh this is pretty cool and i just started doing rap from then that's amazing <laughs> that sounds a lot better than than my beginning <laughs> bloody hell and yeah mine was the church hall and yours is like the church youth club and yours is like proper king <laughs> <laughs> yeah you won something Jeez. Yeah. yeah. So, funny. <laughs> so, how did you come up with your rhymes like at that early age? I mean, were you practicing at home and then bringing? Yeah. Them in? Yeah. So jokes. I was right. The first song I ever wrote was about my mum being drunk. <laughs> that was literally <laughs> the first song. I was like, oh, she like walks around like an epileptic spider, and I remember thinking epileptic was like such an amazing word, like <laughs> in the dictionary. Like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I don't know how I'd come up with rhymes I just kind of I was listening to like a lot of Tupac and like NWA and like all of that sort of stuff and I was just trying to figure out like what they were doing and how they were making it yeah yeah random <laughs> so Chris you played in the in school and in garage bands and you supported King Crimson in the early days yeah right? oh yeah I forgot about that God. <laughs> You Casually. you know a lot about me. <laughs> she was that school girl, didn't I'm back, baby. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's all out there, mate. Uh, yeah, King Crimson. That was like um, that was odd, really. I mean, I kind of all that. We used to get a lot of prog rock bands playing in Plymouth, so there wasn't much choice really. And um, yeah, no, they were. I can't, they did that song, didn't they? That um, some rap guy turned in, put in one of his tracks. What was it called? Uh, 21st Century Schizoid Man. Oh, yeah, yeah. Who used that? Oh, yeah, what was that? Massive hit, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Imagine. Night. Yeah. Mm. Imagine being in a prog rock band and suddenly, you know, from <laughs> in the 70s and suddenly you're in a hip-hop thing. Yeah. No, I started there and then... Um, <laughs> did all that sort of stuff and then um, joined, uh, went to London and joined this sort of, this band called Drill. Yeah. Did you, did you do any research on that? Yeah. Yes, Chris was yeah. playing professionally from leaving school age 17 when his band Drill signed to RCA. Yeah, oh, you got it, yeah, so <laughs> RCA. Um, I, I'll need to get my wiki up so I can have a look as well. Um, uh, yeah, so... so so Usually drill, it's yeah, wrong, no, was... and then it's really embarrassing. Yeah, no, <laughs> exactly, you know. But um, yeah, drill was um, with Chaz Chandler producing us, and I just remember he was such a great producer because he just left us alone, and he didn't yeah. say do this or take two or take three or take four, and he just said, "I'm just going to have two sausage sandwiches, one with brown sauce and one with red, and I'm going to put my feet up on the desk and read the sun," and he said. If anything stops me from eating my sausage sandwiches and reading the sun, I know it's wrong. And that's what wow. he said. And he said, it looks like I'm doing nothing, but I am actually producing you. And that's what he said to <laughs> like us. Mirrors. Yeah, and we were <laughs> we were kind of like going, fuck me, this guy's getting paid. And we're like, <laughs> just sort of, we're in there thinking like, oh, okay. So we just get on with it with the engineer. And... Um, yeah, no, I mean it turned out pretty shit, but it was, a, you know, it was a good begin. It was a good beginning, um, and then you know, then the adamant thing happened. So that was sort of when everything changed after that, really. Right. Um, Let from me sort quickly of up. go back and inform the listeners. So Chaz Chandler, original Animals bassist, and he managed Slade and Jimi Hendrix later on, right? Yeah, that was so. Yeah, no, that, I mean, for me, the biggest thing about that was getting all the Hendrix stories from him, you know, like being in the wow. studio, because, you know, <laughs> Hendrix was my hero. So it was kind of like, 
And this is where he went in and, and he went into the toilet and he wrote the, the lyrics for Wind Cries Mary on the bit of toilet paper and came back in and just sang them over the... I was like, what? It was like, yeah. <laughs> and, then he, and then he said, um, he said, um, you know, this is a weird thing. He, he said, he used to, you know, everyone thinks that he was a drug, you know, drug addict and like totally all over yeah, the place. But he got slandered mm. quite a bit, didn't he, really? Yeah, but apparently he used to get up and he used to, fit, you know, make his tea to have his guitar and he used to practice like all day long, like yeah. seven hours, you know. He obviously meant business. I mean, come on, no one's <laughs> rivaled him, have they? No, and he was like, yeah, he was definitely sort of, um, you know, he was definitely in there. And so basically all those stories were good and then... Slade came into the studio and um, we went for some drinks with them behind. There was a sort of little uh, pub at the back. So, and they liked us. So we got on and they said, oh, do you want to come and support us? Um, so we went on tour with them and that was the kind of initiation into, although we'd supported a lot of punk bands like the adverts and people like that, we were on the same label as them, I think, um, to oh, begin TV, with. TV Smith was on the other day, actually. He's just done a new All oh, right. Really? Yeah, yeah, I love. I he love had you. COVID, so oh, really, yeah, really? lucky oh to be God. here. Really, bloody hell! Yeah, amazing. I, I had a bit of a crush on Gay Advert. I have to say, and when we were playing the music Is machine, now? I... yeah, <laughs> <laughs> there's your chance. Um, Might be a bit more forgetful these <laughs> days, but you know. <laughs> but she, she was. Yeah. Um, I remember sort of like we were supporting her and she used to carry this bottle of vodka around with her. And, you know, she, obviously she looked very cool. And, um, you know, being the support band, I kind of like felt like I couldn't really talk to her. And, and it was weird at the last gig that I did with the Wolfman at the 100 Club, I looked around and she was there with TV Smith. And I sort of, since then, sort of, I've been done some work with TV, um, TV Smith, but it was odd sort of chatting with them and sort of saying, do you realise we were signed to the same label? And there is that guy over there who signed us, who they didn't like. So it was kind of like, you know, and um, weird, weird. Yeah, anyway, so yeah, Drill. Um, so we did that tour with Slade. They, they sort of um, introduced us to rock and roll sort of, you know, life as such. They were like our big brothers. <laughs> nice. So... There weren't any, I mean, we weren't doing drugs. If there were any around, we, we didn't see them. But um, it was just alcohol and girls, really, so, you know, or whatever. And it was just sort of, you know, it was just sort of that thing of up and down the M1, you know, sort of sleeping in little bed and breakfasts, getting your gear nicked, you know, sort of just the usual sort of, it was a good, it was a good, I actually enjoyed it. It was, like, really good. And then, you know... Yeah, that was a good period. Nice. So, did you feel ready when you when you signed to like RCA and when you did the you worked with Chaz Chandler? Because he was like seventeen, right? Yeah, um, I felt ready for it because I'd sort of I played all the shit holes and I was kind of like and I still had many shit holes to play, you know. Yeah, but I kind of felt very ready. Yeah. Nice. Um, and I'm not sure exactly what you what work he did with Lou Reed, but I know you worked with him. So would you mind telling me a bit about that? Yeah, we did. Um, me and Marco Peroni, we had a band called The Wolfman. And um, we did this song called, I don't know, you, do you remember um, Lou Reed had this track called Do the Ostrich in, in the Primitives? No. And um, like basically, <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah, no. And he had this song and it didn't have a chorus or a bridge. So Marco said, why didn't you write one? So I wrote one and we sent it to Lou Reed and he said, yeah, you know, he loved it. So <laughs> we, we got a co-write with Lou Reed. So wow. that's how that came about. Nice. nice. Yeah. Jenna, what kind of like bands of that era are you into? Do you like your 70s rock, that sort of thing? I like like punk and post-punk bands. Like I really love punk and post-punk so much and I like people assume that I like rap and like obviously I love rap but my main love is like punk um like Sex Pistols, The Clash, um I love heavy metal as well so I love like Slipknot um really I didn't know yeah that. man I loved it <laughs> Slipknot's like one of my favorite bands when I watched them live I was like what the fuck <laughs> like because their <laughs> stage props like everything is just like insane um 
but yeah, I love Adam and the Ants <laughs> as well. Oh. <laughs> yeah, oh. you might not know them, but no. they're pretty cool. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I remember like when the internet first happened and it was like mom and dad were like we're getting the internet and I was just like with my friends and we all had like we were proper grungers and we like had those big black flared trousers oh my god we like no. we can ask the internet anything now what are we gonna ask it and we were like what does Slipknot look like without masks oh and my god yeah the first thing that we wanted to <laughs> <Yeah>. know <laughs> power at our fingertips we're like what the fuck does Jerry Jordison look like yeah <laughs> oh they were so amazing I remember like hearing all those like because my cousin got me into Slipknot and I remember her saying like oh my gosh I went to this gig it was so cool like Corey spat on my tits <laughs> I was literally <laughs> so jealous I was like oh <laughs> why not me spat on your tits I love that <laughs> It's, it's normally really? sign your tits, but <laughs> yeah, it's, like it's actually spat. better, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. It's better. It's so cool. <laughs> so you mentioned I met this... you... Sorry, go oh, on. Sorry. I was going to say that um, I met this girl who um, uh, who said that rat scabies had signed her tits. So, uh, <laughs> signed her tit. And she was really... <laughs> sorry, she won't mind me saying this, but uh, she was, like, really a big fan of rat. I told rat, and he said, oh, do you remember that? And he goes, nah, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> probably did it all the time <laughs> yeah does she know what he looks like now <laughs> uh, I do actually yeah does he yeah. <laughs> does she she's <laughs> nice actually yeah she's good but um <laughs> I spoke to Rat about it and yeah he, he said no I don't remember and um I said yeah and you know but he said oh, I used to do that all the time Sign girls' tits, but it's better than spitting. What was it? Is spitting, spitting better than on them? <laughs> yeah, I think that's think. pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe we're like sign booties. That's what we're doing. <laughs> like spank booties. That feels spank more. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you guys have also done a Clash cover because you mentioned earlier that you're a big fan of the Clash. So, how did that come about? Yeah, we did. How many songs did we do? Like four? Was it four? Uh, of them? We did three. four, didn't we? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So did, what did we do? Which ones we did? Um... Um, should I stay? Should I go? Um, Guns of Brixton. Um, what was the other one we did? Magnificent Seven. Uh, Mag- Seven yeah. yeah. And then um, that's four, isn't it? Oh wait, and um, brand new Cadillac, <laughs> the Vince. T- uh, Vince oh yeah, Taylor we got. Well, yeah. that's coming out on um, Cleopatra on the twentieth, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Brand new Cadillac. So, so we did that for Universal. So mm-hmm. we did that for Universal Music. Yeah, Universal Music's recovered digital campaign. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you're also um, recent winners of the best hip hop track at the PMA Mark Awards 2020 in LA. Yeah, that was sick. What does that mean? <laughs> I know, <right? laughs> I've still got that award for you, Jenna. Oh, you still got it? I've got it. Yes. Yeah, I'll give it to you when I see you next. Right, Jenna, I'm really interested to hear more about this uh, women empowerment stuff that you're doing because, uh, mm. well, personally, like, I've always played in bands and I've always noticed that people, like, underestimate me until I get on stage and they might yeah. they might be like, oh, are you the singer? And I'm like, no, I'm the drummer. <laughs> and then, just yeah. laugh. And then <laughs> they'll see me and they'll be like, fair play. But, like, <laughs> I mean, there's there's loads of things wrong in, with the music industry the way it is. It's It can, like be quite damaging to women and there's been a lot of problems mm. i've just read lily allen's autobiography that was really eye-opening about the really? way she suffered but yeah like tell me what um what it means to you yeah i mean like i've had a fair share of like stress in the music industry from being just like i don't know people just assume things of you as soon as you walk in the room they're like oh okay she's just like this little girl like whatever <laughs> you know what i mean like we'll make her wear <laughs> this makeup and do this and do that and it's like no not really like i'm just not that type of character at all like i will just get up and leave <laughs> like i'm not gonna do anything you tell me to do but um yeah there's like so many amazing women in rock and in rap um but yeah in rock and like I don't think many people know about them really like nowadays you know what I mean like Susie Mm. Sue um Joan Jett you know what I mean like there's literally so many cool women 
um but we don't i don't think we get talked about a lot um and i was i was reading like some statistics being smart <laughs> about like um, <laughs> women in like in? <laughs> women in the radio like we ha- like women hardly get plays on radio like ever it's always like male bands and I think yeah when it comes to like rock bands people just um, assume it's going to be male and probably white you know what I mean and it's not true like there's so much diversity in music like we're out here so yeah I just wanted to kind of me and Chris we really want to talk about subjects like that that we care about and that should be talked about um and yeah women empowerment's kind of part of my thing now it's kind of it I got inspired by Bunny in our band really she's like full on like women empowerment um she does like um twerking classes and stuff and like her burlesque and everything's all about like sex education and women empowerment and it's kind of like rubbed off on me a bit and I'm like hang on yeah like we should be talking about this stuff so that's where that come from yeah Definitely. There's a lot of that. I mean, I, 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 I don't know if you ever heard of this. Um, I work with this artist called Judy Nylon, and um, she yeah. did some stuff with Brian Eno, and she was a friend of mine. And she told me this. Um, she told me this story that you know, in the music business, when it, when, you know, when she first started out in probably the late seventies or something, she said it was like rife with chauvinism and like you know, like the sort of things, like. She she was, you know, in discussing a, a record deal with, so I'm not going to name him, but some guy. And, you know, he virtually said, well, you're going to have to suck my cock, you know, to get this deal sort of thing. Wow. And she put a cigarette out on his teeth. <laughs> yes, what a legend. <laughs> she, sorry, I'm not allowed to say that on the radio. Sorry, I shouldn't have said that. But she asked him to do some sexual favour, shall we say. And he, she asked she him. Just, he asked, uh, her. he asked her and then she yeah. just put a, she just put a cigarette out yeah, in his face yeah. sort of thing and walked out but she said it was so hard you know back then yeah man to yeah, um man. you know yeah, to man. be taken seriously and mm-hmm. you know ripped off so many times and you know and that whole thing of, I mean if obviously I worked with Annabella from Bow Wow and she had her stories with Malcolm McLaren and all that mm-hmm. as well so I think it, you know I think it, yeah, I mean, a lot of the female artists I've talked to have been through it. Mm. Yeah, man. And also with fans as well. I find, like, because I'm in a band, then people come up and talk to me after the show, which is absolutely mm. brilliant. I love that. But then you get, like, a guy come up and talk to you and just literally about music and just literally stood in public with two beers talking about music. And then you get, like, the angry wife come up and be, like, mad at you. And you'll be like, oh, right. hey, nice to meet you. How's it going? <laughs> like, what are you doing with my husband? And, like, I'm just a <laughs> fucking musician. <laughs> yeah, I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's hilarious, hilarious. That's you're like a man stealer <laughs> <laughs> oh god but, um what else oh yeah no i heard about i was reading recently about women who have a successful career and then they have kids and the mm. guilt and shame that is associated in the press and with them within themselves of like leaving their kids to go on tour after that and how it's so hard to just do that to carry on their career which is really wow. sad too. Wow. But yeah, mm. hopefully, hopefully yeah. things are changing. I think a lot's a lot's happened in the last few years. Yeah. Since 2017 of Harvey Weinstein and the whole mm. Me Too movement. Then mm-hmm. people are just literally tweeting what they've been through now and other people are going, hey, that guy did that to me as well. And it's just like, mm. it's way more open, which is really good to see. Like, yeah, it's unbelievable, isn't it? I mean, I, I didn't realise that he was involved in the Tarantino movies and all that as the producer. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right, on to greener pastures. <laughs> <laughs> greener. All right. <laughs> so the debut EP, um, like, wow, um, from you guys. So tell tell us a bit about it. So fusion of punk rock, hip hop, and um, bringing together some really special artists between you guys. So... Like, tell us a bit about the subjects you're tackling. Um, so it's racial abuse, homophobia, personal struggles with addiction, all mm-hmm. of that kind of stuff. It's pretty deep stuff. 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I know, right? Nice, nice and green. Ex- green pasture. Yeah, yeah, green. So green right now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this interview is going to need heavy editing because I'm just going to have to throw in a nice question then and come back to this. <laughs> yeah. um, What's your favourite colour, guys? <laughs> it's your press release. I'm not frigging <laughs> making it up. We- Generate the lyrics, so you. I think you better. Well, I mean, yeah, you better answer that one, didn't you? I guess it's quite. It's quite <laughs> funny because, like, we wrote. Well, like after writing all this stuff, I didn't really think about it too much. I was just like venting it all out. Um, and then it's only since when we did the like press release, like to talk about it, I realised how much me and Chris actually have in common, and it's so funny because like. We've known each other for so long, but we just get in and we just do music. Do you know what I mean? Like, we don't yeah. really sit there and be like, oh, you when I was four, what happened to you? <laughs> like, do you know what I mean? We're just like, let's do this. Like, let's smash this music. And then, yeah, we sat there and was like, oh, my gosh, no way. Like, you went through all of this. Like, this everything I went through, like, he's been through as well. So it's amazing that we've managed to write something that tells both of our stories without even knowing it. Um, yeah. But yeah, like it's basically talking about like addiction. Um, yeah, I had like a real battle with addiction because I got into music young and then I had all of this trauma that I was just carrying around like for fun. I <laughs> just carry around all this trauma and I just thought I could kind of run away from it. Um, so I tried to move like to London. I was like, oh, Wales, like, I'd get rid of that and everything would be fine. Then I was like, oh, let me do music. And then when I do that, everything will be fine. And like, it just was never fine. And so I went into full blown just addiction, trying to escape it. That didn't work. Um, But yeah, now I'm like in such a good space and I can channel all of that stuff into music. Um, And yeah, like, so it's basically that EP is like talking about sexual abuse, um, racism, everything basically, it's just, being authentic and just telling our truth, um, like not holding back. I haven't got another truth to tell, so that's the one I've got to go with. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it was interesting, wasn't it? When we were when we were sort of writing together, I remember sort of there was a point in the album where it came to, and I, we were just chatting, and mm. and it was it was obvious that the album was, you know, about getting it out, mm. and. We, we were kind of like had this discussion, oh, should we put on some, I think we had a discussion about, should we put on some lighter songs? Because they're all a bit <laughs> heavy. And then, I, and then I said, no, let's just go for it. Just fucking get it all out. Yeah. Just so like let's- Heavyweight let's... boxes are coming up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, no holding back. So I'm really pleased that we went for it. And, you know. Same. Yeah. So, um yeah, no, I think I think we definitely did um, got it all out on that one. I think we've still got a little bit left for the second one. Yeah. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's not going to be all... <laughs> yeah. no, it's not going to be Cliff Richard songs on the second one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, God, no. <laughs> They're darker imagine? than anything we've talked about so far. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so for people listening in, like we're a community station and we've got like a lot of young listeners... Um, mm-hmm. what would you what would you recommend them about getting support like what was the turning point for you with your addiction um yeah I would just say definitely don't be scared to ask for help um because that was like the main problem that I had I just thought no nah, I'm fine like I can sort it all out and no nah, <laughs> like I really couldn't um there's no shame in it you know what I mean there's loads of people out there that are actually out there to help and they will care and you know what I mean you're, you've got support you're not alone um but yeah I really didn't believe that I was so I was very aggressive like I'm still full of rage but like I was like proper yeah. like and really shut down and just like you couldn't really get in there you know what I mean I wasn't in touch with like my emotions so anyone saying like oh reach out like people are there I was like oh piss off mate like <laughs> no <laughs> yeah. but it's it's true like there are people out there you're not alone so just ask for help that's what I would say yeah did you find it uh, easier to talk to a stranger or like close friends yeah strangers um because at the I got to the point where I'd really built up so many walls like the people closest to me were the like most 
like put away like I had my arms out like just don't talk to me and you know I mean I, I would only give certain amount of like information that I would want them to hear so I think it was easier to talk to someone I didn't know mm. um but yeah I ended up going to like doctors rehab all of that good rock and roll shit <laughs> yeah but yeah it really it really worked it helped yeah and are you mm. teetotal now or are you just managing things yeah man I'm sober I'm seven years sober Ooh, which wow. is mad it's incredible <laughs> yeah. isn't it it's <laughs> right. like when I first met you because I, I didn't realize that you had any any you were you were sort of you know going through any sort of weird shit with addictions and stuff <laughs> and then you just disappeared for a while so yeah. um yeah, no, it was it was weird because I I didn't have a clue apart from a few little signs, you know, things like you're not turning up and making up excuses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like oh, I've got food poisoning for the fifth time today. <laughs> yeah. You're like Adam Ant used to do this. <laughs> yeah, I used to think it was just normal, so I just thought, like, oh, you know, not turning up is just normal rock and roll stuff. So. Um, yeah. So when you went into rehab, I wasn't sort of, you know, surprised or anything, but because I'm not surprised by anyone doing anything in rock and roll. So, yeah. Wow. All right, I've got to ask about Adam Ant, mate. <laughs> oh, Adam Ant, yeah. Yeah, so 1982 to 86, you're a full-time member of the band. You played every performance, did all the TV appearances, the videos, you even did Live Aid as a bass guitarist and a backing vocalist. So, wow. Yeah, that no, it was fun. It was a good, uh, that was a good, good bit of uh, you know getting out, getting off the M1, sleeping in bed and breakfast. It was a bit of a you know, bit of luxury for a little bit. Yeah, no, it was good. Live Aid was, um, you know, I wasn't really expecting it to be such a big gig. You know, I was thinking I just put in my diary charity gig, so I just really thought it was just going to be some small you know charity thing, and which meant we weren't going to get paid. So, you know, I just thought, well, it was fine, charity, do it. And then when we turned up and it was Wembley, I didn't, it still didn't dawn on me, really. Yeah. Till sort of way after, you know, well, the day after. Um, then I realised sort of, well, this is something, been just part of history, you know, it's like quite a, quite a big thing, you know, to wake up to. But I didn't realise it while I was doing it, so I wasn't really nervous. Was it your biggest show? Um. Career? I think it was, yeah. I think it was the biggest well, it show. It must be, I suppose, because wasn't there like two billion people watching on telly? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can't get a bigger gig than that, can you? But it's pretty big. No, it was, um, it was a shame because we only had one song, but I didn't mind really, you know, to be honest with you, being, I mean, I was, at, you know, it was, I don't know what, I didn't know anything about the politics. Everyone said something went down, but. I didn't care really, you know, it's fine. One song's great, you know, just to have played one song on it is good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what was it yeah, like the stage? Oh, it was great. It was really good. You know, it was like really sort of walked on stage and just all this warmth just hit you. It was just from the audience. It was just like, wow, this is so, you know, it's like so big that the energy from the audience was amazing. Um, and Adam was like jumping all over the place. <laughs> um, and then I had to sort of, I was stuck on the mic because I had to do all the, I was kind of ghosting his lead vocal. Yeah. So when he was out of breath, there was me <laughs> singing sort of thing on the mic. So um, I wanted to go up the front and pose around a bit, but I was stuck on the mic <laughs> a lot. So, but yeah, no, it was good. I did get up, I did get up there when I did get off the mic though. But yeah, it's good. Wicked. Great so gig. What about backstage? Did you see like Bob or you two or Queen or? Um, they, yeah, they were all backstage. You know, all the sort of usual people. Yeah, you know, nothing. It wasn't like anything extreme it was just all very well behaved you know um sort of everyone was on their best behavior for some reason it was like being at church <laughs> <laughs> honestly it was not there was no not like normal it was like being at church i imagine <laughs> so, you imagine <laughs> so how do you initially get your first gig with uh, with Adam and how did you like meet him and get on, um, get on with him? I'm trying to think, it was just through an advert um, which said bass player needed must be able to stand and deliver. Um, so yeah. I knew it was Adam. Just went there, did the audition, 
Um, he asked me if I want to go on a world tour. I said, yeah, um, he said, <laughs> here's some money. And that was it, really. So it started off like that. It wasn't sort of anything dramatic. It was just sort of, you know, here's some money. Let's go on a world tour. <laughs> I love how that's not dramatic. <laughs> well, it, it was for me. It, it was like, you know, I was living in Walthamstow at the time. And I remember sort of getting the tube back and thinking, oh, I've got some money. And I'll go and buy <laughs> yeah. another TV. So I went up to the market. <laughs> And I bought a colour TV and I was married at the time. And I walked back and I said to Julie, um, I walked back and I said to Julie, um, hey, I've got a colour TV. She goes, oh, that's good. And I felt really pleased. I felt really pleased with myself because I was so sort of poor at the time. You'll be watching uh, me on that for live aid. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. Yeah, so that was, that was uh, the big break. Yeah, no, it was nice. It was great. Yeah, it was good. So I saw you in the desperate but not serious video, which looked pretty crazy. And you're, just, <laughs> oh you're playing whilst Adam's like boxing in a boxing ring. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah. Do you remember filming that? Sorry. Do you remember filming that? Oh yeah, we did it outside that where that Skin Two Club used to be. Um, in I think it was in Forbit's place, you know, um, in Soho, and um, it was freezing cold. It was like at night. And um, we just had to wear all these strange outfits. I remember thinking, why am I wearing this? And thinking, I just want to put my leather jacket on sort of thing. And mm -hmm. for, um, Adam said, right, you've got to wear this, these clothes. So we put them on. And, you know, they were pretty good. They were pretty well designed, like really well designed. And, um, but I just wasn't used to dressing up, you know, like yeah. with all that stuff. I mean, I kind of got into the makeup. Even though you hung out with while. Slade. Yeah. Well, Slade, yeah, that's, that's true, isn't it, really? I should have should have been used... To, I used to wear makeup and I used to sort of... But this was a bit more... This was different. This was, like, really sort of quite over-the-top stuff Adam was into. Um, and I just wasn't used to dressing like that, I guess. But um, I got used to it. And um, wearing makeup, getting ready. It took about an hour to get ready for stage every night. So it was, like, a lot, you know, a lot of makeup and stuff. I mean... When we got to the Viva La Rock period, there was no makeup and it was just wearing leather jackets and jeans. and So it wasn't so, um, it didn't take any time at all to get ready, really. So, yeah, it's a bit easier. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I just want to ask you a bit about the Friend or Foe album, the first album that you did with them. What was it like uh, recording? What was it like in the studio and how long did that take? Well, that one I wasn't on, actually. Oh, really? No. Damn, I knew there would be a hole in my questions at some point. <laughs> um, I was on such a roll. Isn't you were, <laughs> Sorry. I was trying to think, friend or foe. Bob was on it. Bob, the drummer, Bob Vitchling, you know, the oh, can. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He was on it. Um, and then I joined when that was being released. And I think what happened was Adam put my name on the single, so it looked like I played on it but he'd actually played on it. So, but that was my first video that I was in. And the first sort of top of the pop support. No, it was Puss in Boots, I think. That was off strip, wasn't it? Was that before? <laughs> I, I can't remember. How was Top of the Pops? Uh, top of the Pops was kind of like, um, well, it was great. I mean, we did it a lot. We did Top of the Pops quite a few times. It's very, I don't know if you've done it. Um, no. Have you done it? No, it, it was like it was very, it's very tedious because you have to be spend all day in a BBC studio, and then, mm. you know, then you have to go up and do a bit. I mean, the most exciting thing is all the bands downstairs having a fight or you know squabbling <laughs> over some drinks, some warm lagers, <laughs> and you know. But yeah, top of the pops is it was you know it's great doing it. But then, you know, it was just such a long day. But yeah, no, it was it was exciting seeing yourself on the TV for the first time. Well, actually, it wasn't it was it exciting? No, I kind of like I didn't like it actually. The first time I watched myself back <laughs> on Top of the Pops, I thought, oh my God. And my dad came in <laughs> and he sort of shook his head and he went, Oh my God. And he said, What's <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> he said, Look, all that makeup. <laughs> it, was like, <laughs> it was funny. <laughs> Excellent. So how did it end with Adam? Um, I think it just ended like we, we were going to go to Tokyo and I sort of had enough, really. And 
And I just sort of said, look, you know, if you want to get someone in, else in for the next tour, that would be great. Um, but I'll stay on until you do. And then the, the next tour didn't happen. So, but we just yeah. stayed mates, really, you know, it was fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. <laughs> I think he's fine now, but there was a story about him wielding a gun in a Camden pub. And um, oh, yeah. he had a bit I of a would... tough time mentally, didn't he, poor sod? Yeah, I mean, I, was, I spent a lot of time with him because he called me up when he got sectioned. Well, I yeah, was with him wow. the night before he got sectioned, actually. before The night before the gun thing, I was with him. Yeah. And we were in Soho, and um, I thought he was just having some fun. I didn't realise he was, you know, I just thought, thank God he's relaxed and he's enjoying himself. <laughs> you know, yeah. we had such a good night. And then I got a phone call from, you know, Hampstead, uh, you know, the psychiatric ward, and um, they said, oh, we've got Stuart Goddard on the phone. And... Um, he said, come and get me out, Chrissy boy. So, you know, kind of went up there. And then we did a little show for the inmates. So we did yeah. a little, little, you had two acoustic guitars. So we did um, we did a show up there for them. That was a bit odd. But, um, yeah, that was fun, actually. It was good. But, yeah, he's all right now. I think it was just needed to get out and start playing again. And I mean, have you seen him since he's started doing his shows? No, I'd really love to go see him live, definitely on the bucket list, but um, yeah. no, unfortunately I haven't seen him yet. No, he's really good. He's great to play. I mean, honestly, such a great performer and um, really funny bloke. I mean, really, you just sort of, I, I kind of was laughing most of the time with him. He's just such a funny guy. All right. So I know, Jenna, you've got to go soon. Thank you so much for your time. It was really lovely to yeah, speak thanks, to you. Man. It's yeah, thanks, man. fun. That was really good. All right, guys. Well, I'm loving the new material. We're going to be spinning it on Way Out Radio. So let us know where we can um, buy your merch, support your music. How can we get in touch with you guys? Yes, yeah, so our first EP comes out on um, in a few days now, isn't it? On the 8th of yeah. January. And then we've got a brand new Cadillac with Cleopatra Records on the 20th. Um, and yeah, it's on all goods like digital platforms. Um, where Rue Girl and CC, and we've got uh, we've just set up Twitter, Instagram, all of that. And yes, yeah, at Rue Girl and CC. All right, that's a wrap, guys. Thank you very much. Thank all you. Right, thanks, <laughs> Great to meet you. Hey guys, DJ Paula Frost here from Way Out Radio, the one and only punk and reggae station broadcasting every week. Go to wayoutradio.com for more. So I just want to tell you guys about the brand new fan club we've just launched. It's absolutely amazing. You can choose from contributing £5, £10 or £20 per month to keep the station alive, pay our guests handsomely and keep music money in the musician's pocket and in the punk world and in the reggae world. So find out more about that at wayoutradio.com. Thank you very much.